Hi, this is Scott Morrison. Welcome to the Foothills Calvary YouTube channel. We're a church located in Lakewood, Colorado as part of the Calvary Chapel movement. Our goal is to provide an opportunity for you to hear the whole word of God preached chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and follow along as we read God's word together. We hope you find this channel encouraging and that God speaks to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit. All right, today we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, um, but let's pray first. Father, we thank you uh, for the, the ability we have to be here in this place at this time um, in an amazing country where we have freedom and we can freely open up our Bibles, we can worship you, we can read what your word says, we can fellowship together, we can pray with and for each other, we can practice our faith boldly with confidence. Um, and Lord, this morning we ask that you would open our eyes and ears and hearts to your word, that we may receive it, God, that it would change us. Lord, as the beginning of this book of Revelation says, we are blessed for reading, for learning, for studying, and for applying what this book tells us to. And so we thank you for that blessing. So we surrender this time to you and ask to you that you would speak to us, Father. That, that's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Revelation 21, All Things New is the title of the message today. Um, how many Trekkie fans? Do we have Star Trek fans? Anybody? Two of us, three of us, maybe. Oh, we're going to have to have a Star Trek a thon or something. Remember the opening line of Star Trek. Even if you're not a Trekkie, you've probably heard it Space, the final frontier, right? We've, you had to have heard it somewhere. But that's not true, is it? Heaven. Spending eternity in heaven is actually the final frontier. Oh, you've seen the commercial where there's two guys, they're sitting at the bar and they're drinking a beer together. One says to the other, doesn't get any better than this. Uh, actually, it does. Actually, it does. If you're a Christian, it gets much better than just sitting at a bar drinking a beer. Heaven. Heaven's been the focus for us as Christians. That is those who believe in God. According to the Bible, that's where we as Christians indeed go, and we do believe in God's word that it is true. We have a biblical worldview, a biblical perspective. There was once two men who uh, lived in the same neighborhood, in the same subdivision, in fact, and one man was a, a pastor, the other man was a salesman, and the pastor actually died at the same time that the salesman had flown off to uh, Florida on a business trip. When he arrived in Florida, he wanted to telegram his wife to tell her that he had arrived safely. So he sends a telegram. But the telegram, instead of going to his wife, went to the wife of the pastor who had just died in that same subdivision. And you can imagine to her astonishment when she opened up the telegram and it read, Arrived safely. The heat here is terrible. Not what she expected. Perspective. We have a perspective of what heaven is going to be like, and it doesn't involve heat. <laughs> the hope of heaven. That's what drives us. There's so many songs and, and books written on heaven, yet we tend to get caught up in the things of the world, don't we? And the things that are tangible that we can touch. We, we, we get caught up in the self-pleasing and the pride. We lose sight of the hope of heaven. That should be something we think about every day. I can't wait to get there. We see in scripture and we even talk about angels, but do we really comprehend the fact that angels get to hang out in heaven? As they dove into this amazing chapter, it caused me to pause and think for a minute. And what is the true purpose of the church? I mean, the church is a hospital. It's where those who are sick and hurting can come and be healed by the great physician, Matthew 9, starting in verse 12. The church is also a school. It's where we study to show ourselves approved. 2 Timothy 2.15. The church is a gymnasium. It's where we work out our salvation, Philippians 2.12. It's where we exercise unto godliness, 1 Timothy 4.7. Now, all of these are good. But perhaps the most important thing the church should be is a travel agency. Booking excursions to heaven that last for eternity. Revelation 21 and 22 is the perfect travel brochure for such a journey. 
a journey that will take all believers to a place where all things will be new, starting with a new heaven, a new earth, and then the holy city, a, a new Jerusalem. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. John has been, again, been getting an eyeful and an earful this whole time, 20 plus chapters thus far. Try, can you imagine everything he's seen and everything he's heard? It's mind blowing. David Guzik breaks Revelation into three sections. Revelations one through three is uh, Jesus, the Lord of the churches. Revelation four through chapters four through 20, Jesus is the lion over the nations. And then Revelation 21 and 22, Jesus, the lamb among believers. So everything we've been waiting for as we've been reading is finally here. History as we know and understand it is over at this point. We read last week about the eternal state of unbelievers. And now we get to see our eternal state where we as believers will spend eternity, a new heaven and earth. One commentator puts it this way. The new perspective of the last section is glorious. From the smoke and pain of the, and the heat of what we talked about last week, it, it is relief to pass into the clear, clean atmosphere of the eternal morning where the breath of heaven is sweet and the vast city of God sparkles like a diamond in the radiance of his presence. There's something I like about springtime. You know, we change seasons and... You know me, I love the colder weather anyways, but, but I also like that. I like the sunshine, kind of the fresh air that comes with the, a changing of seasons. And I know we're not there yet. We're not out of winter yet. But this morning I had the windows down on the truck and I'm driving up the hill and it's like 44 degrees. It was beautiful. Oh, it was heaven. But that aspect, I was thinking on the way up here about, it just was fresh this morning. It was clean. It was clear. I wasn't breathing in the smog and the pollution. And, and that's kind of cool, but... But that's just a touch of what heaven's really going to be like. How fresh the breath will be when we're there. In the Old Testament, Isaiah spoke of the new heaven and earth. Isaiah 65, 17 through 18 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and for people's gladness. And in the New Testament... Peter refers to it in 2 Peter 3, 12 through 13, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So when we hear that word heaven, when you hear it, what comes to mind when we think of heaven? Do you think of the pearly gates? Streets of gold, little angels floating by on a cloud playing a harp. If you get enough of them, you got surround sound. Maybe seeing a loved one who's gone before you, finally reuniting with them. Maybe being reuni reunited with your dog. Now, I don't know if do all dogs go to heaven. They made a movie. Must be true. Probably no cats there, though. Um, <clears throat> sorry. If you have a cat, I'm sorry. I, I love you but not your cat. The Oxford Dictionary defines heaven. <laughs> Someone's got, I'm going to get a letter. <laughs> Sorry. Oxford Dictionary defines heaven this way. A place regarded in various religions as the abode of God or the gods and of angels and of the good after death, traditionally depicted as being above the sky. Well, that's, that's a worldview. There are many who do not believe in hell. We've talked about that but there's also many who do not believe in heaven. Heaven is a real place. It's described in the Bible. The word heaven is found 276 times in the New Testament alone. Scripture refers to three heavens. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 was caught up into the third heaven, but he was prohibited from revealing what he had experienced there. 
In the Old Testament, the sky or firmament is the most frequent reference. This is the heaven that contains the clouds. It's, it's where the birds fly. Then we have the second heaven is in space, outer space. It's where the stars, the planets, or the celestial objects are. You can see that in Genesis 1.14. But then the third heaven, it's in a location that we don't know. It's not revealed, and it is, it's, it's the dwelling place of God. And just for the record, that heaven is not being renovated. Jesus promised to prepare a place for true Christians in heaven. In John 14, 2, he says he's preparing a place for us. Now, Old Testament saints who died trusting in God's promises are there. And according to John 3, 16, whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life in heaven. And John is watching this all happen right before his eyes. So he reports on the heavenly city, the the new heaven, the new earth, all which possess the glory of God, the very presence of God. Jesus says in verse 5, behold, I am making all things new, not just a remodel. Um, When Doyle, when I was working for Doyle and we were doing construction, we had a couple builders and they would do remodel stuff. It wasn't really remodel. You have to leave a certain percentage of the house up and then you get to bypass all the extra fees and taxes and things, Right? And so we had these houses where they'd go in and knock everything down except for two walls and they'd leave part of the foundation. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about new. We know this because Jesus said in Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. As we read earlier in Isaiah, God said that he would create a new heaven and earth. The word create means to create out of nothing in Hebrew. It's not just a spiritual or moral newness either. It's a genuine physical transformation. It is a city, a new heaven, a new earth beyond our comprehension. We had the new millennial earth in chapter 20 last week. Now we're looking to the new heaven and earth, that thing which we all long for, the location of heaven and eternity. Barnhouse points out here what I said a little bit earlier. It is here that we see the end of history of time, that which we know, and we see the beginning of the history of eternity. A side note here, as we read, it said no more sea. It's to remember that the Jewish mindset was that the sea was considered a place of separation from God. It was considered a place of evil. The beast in Revelation 13 came from the sea considered a place of the dead in Revelation 20, 13. So according to scripture, no more see. Now I know that makes some of you sad. Some of you that send me pictures of the beach every time I post something about snow or the mountains or how beautiful 20 degrees is. Sorry, no more see. But I don't think you'll care once you're there. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, the capital city for eternity, Hope restored, finally home where our true citizenship is. Remember that we're just passing through this place. We're sojourners. This isn't home. Eternity in heaven is home. The city is filled with brilliance of costly stones and crystal clear jasper. Heaven has 12 gates and 12 foundations. The paradise of the Garden of Eden is restored. The river of water of life flows freely and the tree of life is available once again, yielding fruit monthly and leaves that heal the nations. And however eloquent John was in describing heaven, the reality of heaven is beyond our ability or the ability of finite man to describe. It is holy. It is new. It's different from any earthly city you pick any city on the, on the planet and tell me that's the most beautiful city. Mm, not even close. Dave Guzik said, it is significant that the glorious dwelling, the place of God and his people is described as a holy city. Cities are places with many people, many interacting with each other. It's not isolation. It's perfect community of the people of God. This new Jerusalem is indeed heaven as a city a place of life, a place of activity, interest, people. It's very different from the Hindu conception of of that blank nirvana of nothingness. The consummation of the Christian hope is supremely social. 
is we need each other. We need each other now. I tell you that all the time. You don't do life alone. We walk through life together. We walk through the good times together. We walk through the heavy times together. This is carried over even into the new earth and to the new Jerusalem. We're still together. God brings unity. Since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, genuine community has been a struggle. That Sin is the destroyer of relationships. The new Jerusalem is sinless. It's pure. It's a community of righteousness. Truly a holy city. We struggle when we try to establish those things now. If any of you know the history of, of Waco, Texas, and what happened there, or Jim Jones. You see, when you do things like that and try to make things where we think it's the right thing, it increases an opportunity for error and for deception. We do need and strive for a genuine community. But we've got to make sure it's biblical, that it is Holy Spirit-led, that it's not man-made. The city is not and never can be an achievement of man. That This city that we're talking about is a gift from God. Made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. You know, I remember, and I don't know many, some of you remember as well, but I remember seeing Pam for the first time as she walked down that aisle in her wedding dress. Wow. Like that's the image that we're getting in our text. John described it with amazing accuracy. The image of a beautiful bride. See, the most beautiful thing a man will see in his lifetime is his wife as she walks down to joy in him. That's the image John is giving us of how amazingly beautiful the new Jerusalem will be. Then there's the tabernacle of God. Now Moses created, at the direction of God, a mobile tabernacle. It was a representation of where God lived on earth. In the new Jerusalem, the tabernacle of God is his presence his habitation with us. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people. You see, this shows the, the desire of God, the very purpose that we were created to have fellowship with him and to glorify and worship God, the author and creator of everything that we know. The very one who fulfills all of his promises. I can't, this brings hope. Guys, we, we get bogged down and frustrated with everything else that's going on in the world. We need to look to heaven. We need to look to the hope of what God is bringing us. Yeah, we still have to walk through some things, but we have hope. This is the greatest glory of heaven and the ultimate restoration of what was lost in the fall. Spurgeon said, I don't think the glory of Eden lay in the grassy walks or the boughs bending and the luscious fruit, but... Its glory lays in the fact that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Here, Adam's highest privilege that he had companionship with the Most High. Because we get to walk with God. We get to be right there in his presence. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Question for you this morning. How many of you have experienced tears, death, mourning, and pain this week? How about the last month? How about this last year? <laughs> Maybe it's been continuous. It's, it's continually there. You're walking through something very heavy. How many of you are ready for all that to go away? <laughs> yep. Come on. That's what we're watching for. See, that place is built for us. Heaven is nothing like anything we've ever experienced. However, there is a great void in heaven. Shocking, isn't it? A void in heaven? It's a place that is void of or free from sin, death, fear, guilt, sorrow. Finally, our fallen nature will not be present. It will not dictate anything into our lives. Separation from our loved ones, loss, worry, sickness, crime, pain, injustice, all of it's taken care of. We'll be absolutely free to become all that God has created us to be. All for his praise, all for his glory. And best of all, we'll enjoy full, wonderful fellowship with our Lord and Savior forever and ever. 
those things of the past, the, the former things, gone. Also gone, no temple, no sacrifice, no sun, no moon, no darkness, no sin, no abomination. Can we even fathom that? We also have to remember to not let the guilt and manipulation of those on the earth who misread this as tears of the saints' regrets. Wolverd puts it this way, there is no just ground for imagining from this text that the saints will shed tears in heaven concerning the failures of their former life on earth. The emphasis here is on the comfort of God, not on the remorse of saints. So we're not going to get to heaven and go, I can't believe I did that thing. It's not going to matter. As followers of Christ, you have been redeemed. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, what a hope we have in heaven. Heaven is a place of no more, no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more separation because death will be conquered once and for all. But wait, there's more. The best thing about heaven is that presence of the Lord and Savior. We'll be face to face with the Lamb of God who loved us and sacrificed himself for, with, for us that we can enjoy his presence. We're going to be with him for eternity. Tony Evans simply says it this way, all sadness, hurt, and disappointment will be no more as we live alongside our creator. All new things. Verse five, and he sits on the throne, behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. It's here that we clearly hear God speaking from his throne with authority. That statement, behold, I am making all things new. It's present tense as he speaks it. A completion of what is started now here with each of us is being completed. It brings a great deal of hope to me. I'm excited that we get next. We're going into the book of uh, Philippians. We have a couple more weeks in Revelation. Then we have Easter and Palm Sunday and all that. But we're getting into the book of Philippians and uh, I look at Paul in Philippians 1.6. It says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. As I was studying this, the Holy Spirit reminded me of each of the kind of the main touch points of work that was beginning to happen in me personally. Five years old. You know, we all did that thing in the Sunday school class. I asked Jesus into my heart. 13 years old, being filled with the Holy Spirit. 17 years old, being called into full-time ministry. I'm sorry, 26 years old, being called into full-time ministry. 49 years old, being called to be the pastor here. Like we get these timelines, five years, 13 years, 17 years, 26 years, 49 years. That all sounds perfect, right? Everything just falls into place. But the in-between times, that's when I was, I know, Shock, I'm human. I make mistakes. I've failed. I've been prideful. I've been sinful. In honest, all honesty, I've been downright rebellious at times. But God, who is faithful, will complete his promises. See, Matthew 20, or 19, 26 says, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. What is possible? All things. Everything you want and desire, Right? No. What is God's will? Those things are possible in your life. As we walk in God's will, as he begins a new work within us, it is possible for us to complete it as long as we are surrendering our lives to him and walking in obedience to him and to his word. All things are possible. God is faithful, always faithful, to finish what he begins. And he does so in a way that is above and beyond all we can ask or imagine. Never underestimate what he will continue to do through your faithfulness long after you have completed your obedient service to him. You see, our faithfulness leaves a legacy. I remember my, my great-grandma went to church. She prayed for me all the time. It's part of the reason I'm standing here is because my great-grandma was praying for me. But she left a life and a legacy of faith, as did my grandma as is my mom, right? As I want to do for my kids and my grandkids. Listen, God has started a work in you. Every single person that can hear my voice. God has started a work in you and he will complete it. 
as long as you stay out of the way, right? We have to be obedient to God's word. We have to engage in our faith. We're the ones that slow things down. Will we step fully into what it is that God has for us to do? You see, one day Paul was killing Christians. The next day he was a Christian. One day Peter was a fisherman. The next day he was a fisher of men. So don't judge yourself or someone else based on one day, on, on bad things that you've done. The reality is that if God can create the whole world in six days, he surely can create a new heart in one day. Amen? Paul wrote of this transforming work in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond our all comparison. While we look not to the things which are seen, but to the things which are not seen. The things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen are eternal. Things that seem so heavy now are light in comparison to eternity. Then in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. This would really bring us hope. All things new. It's hard for us to comprehend God's plan for eternity. I, I don't understand. Why allow sin and destruction, everything else that's happened around us? Well, it's so a greater work can be completed, making all things new. In our text, at this point, in his plan of the ages, the plan is complete. All things are new. God's perfect plan is redemption. And here in our text, it is complete and will remain so for eternity. And I love this part of verse 5. It kind of made me laugh. Right, for these words are faithful and true. Well, we know why John was up there. But if I was standing there and I saw all these things, I would be so astounded as well at everything that was being said and everything that was being shown to me that, yeah, somebody would have to say, hey, hello, <laughs> you need to keep writing. Write this down. Pay attention, quit staring, and write. Write these words, they're faithful and true. Verses six through eight, then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give you the one who thirsts from the spring of water and the life without co of life without cost. And he who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, the murderers, the immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It is done. What did we hear Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. He was taking care of our sin so redemption could happen. It is done. The very moment we talk about all of our Christian lives is here. It is now complete. The work Jesus did on the cross has accomplished its purpose. The fullness of time mentioned in Ephesians 1.10 is fulfilled. So literally everything is resolved. Everything is done. It is done. He says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Simplicity here is, is so profound free flowing water from the spring of water of life for eternity. You know, I think even on Sunday morning, I get a nice glass of water. Donna brings me, the, usually the ice in there, it melted. It's fresh. Can you imagine that, that glass of water and you're out working in the heat of the summer and you grab that ice cold water and you just drink, right? It refreshes. It restores, it renews. It's refreshing, cold water. The satisfaction that you get from that is nothing compared to the satisfaction to come. Your needs that will be met at the very core of your being. It's what God is going to do. That's what heaven's going to be like. As we study God's word, we see drinking and thirst. We see how it's used to show God's provision and mad spiritual need. To drink, though, requires a man to take action. That is to receive it. If I'm going to drink it, I've got to do something to receive it. But really, we receive based on 
God's grace and mercy. It's not about anything of ourselves. It's not about our works or what we do. It is God that is offering us that fresh water. It's God that is offering it through his grace and his mercy. Spurgeon said, what does a thirsty man do to get rid of his thirst? He drinks. Perhaps there's no better representation of faith in all the word of God than that. To drink is to receive, to take in the refreshing draw, and that is all. It's simply taking it in. A man's face might be unwashed, yet he can drink. He might be unworthy in character, but he can yet draw water, and it will still remove his thirst. Drinking is such a remarkably easy thing, it's even more simple than eating. That's how easy it will be when we're in heaven. For seven, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. First John 5, 5 says, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So those who overcome do so by faith in Jesus. We enjoy a special relationship with God. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Well, it sounds like adoption. Adopt. To adopt someone is to make that person a legal son or daughter. You guys have heard us talk about it. We have fam ministry here, foster adopt ministry, taking care of kiddos with the hope of restoring them to their family, but short of that, encouraging and walking with those who are in the adoption process. Adoption. It's one of the metaphors used in the Bible to explain how Christians are brought into the family of God. The Bible says Jesus came that we might receive adoption to sonship. He was successful according to God's word because it said you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own child. See, the Bible also uses the metaphor of being born again into God's family. As the adopted children of God, we are heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And we overcome when we suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him. As a believer... You are a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords for eternity. You're a child of God. And he loves you unconditionally. We're given a reminder of what we saw last week, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable. They they have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. A reminder, those who reject Jesus and make themselves apostate are specifically prohibited from entering the new Jerusalem. Corson says, vastly more comforting than the fact that murderers and sorcerers and liars won't be in in heaven is the fact that I will be. You see, all of these tendencies are inherent within me, but they'll be burned up, not allowed in my eternal destination. There's where coming at... Coming a time, there's coming a time when I will truly be set free from the flesh of which I grow ever wearier as I grow older. Heaven will be a safe place because the flesh within me will be cast away. And for that, I am so grateful. Won't that be nice? Don't have to worry about the flesh rising up. Longing for that moment, amen? Now even greater detail, Revelation 21, 9 through 10, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls from the full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, come here, I'm gonna show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. You see, one of the angels who was involved in the judgments upon the earth is still active and working for God's glory and he carried John away. He wanted him to see the new Jerusalem called the Bride of Christ because that's where the people of God gather together. This heavenly city is literal. In this sense, the new New Jerusalem is certainly like the bride, but the association doesn't diminish the reality behind the image. The city is associated with the bride to awe us with a sense of its beauty. And I hadn't thought about it as we read this next part, how far the angel would have had to take him away to be able to see this massive new city. Verses 11 through 14, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12, uh, and at the gates, 12 angels. The names were written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. 
There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Can you imagine that scene? John is taken back by the beauty and glory of the city. The glory of God is what's showing there. Radiant light, sun, moon, stars, none of it was needed. It was the glory of God that was lighting it up. Some scholars say that the description of clear crystal, that the jasper is actually a diamond. A diamond, a very fitting description. In a city which the church, the body of Christ resides, and not in a holy arrogance that we deserve diamonds, but the actual fact that the diamonds, like diamonds, were simply chunks of worthless coal made brilliant by heat and by pressure. What Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you should share the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. But to be honest, I don't like this makes me uncomfortable. We read this verse and we think, why me? We ask when fiery trials come upon us, why me? Why do I have to go through this? Why is this happening to me? The real question though is, why not? If suffering loosens sin's grip on us and causes us to see others differently, if it places us in good company, if it keeps us focused on eternity and frees us to participate in ministry, then why wouldn't we embrace it as a necessary part of our growth? I mean, I, how many of you like to be uncomfortable? None of us do. The heat and pressure of life that transforms us into diamonds, transforms us into what it is that God wants us to be. It's not very comfortable. You see, God uses what we go through to bring glory to his name, to strengthen the body of Christ, and to bring others into his kingdom. That's what we do. We start going through something. We're like, get me out of here, God. Beam me up. I want out. The idea is that God is using it for his glory and to strengthen you. So we've got to change our perspective. This walled city is, uh, was not one of defense because all of the enemies had been defeated. But this wall was designed to define this great city and also to make a point that only the righteous will enter. Twelve gates, we've all heard of them. Which one's Peter at? We've all heard the stories and made many, many jokes of Peter. He's, being at, he's at the pearly gates checking people's ID to see if they're in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? It's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. But the 12 names of the tribes of Israel are on the gates showing unity and solidifying the heritage of the people of God and what they had with Israel. God has not forgotten them. He's not replaced them. He values them even to eternity. The reference to the three gates, the east, north, south, and west, caused some commentators to connect the design back to the layout of the camp during the Exodus as they left Egypt. Verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This reiterates the importance of, of the old covenant and the new covenant. 12 gates representing Israel of old, 12 foundation stones as an everlasting testimony of the new. All the apostles, they're part of that foundation. All with value in God's eyes for his plan. He's bringing everything together. All in unity. The new Jerusalem and the church are founded upon the apostles with Christ as the chief cornerstone. Thus the names of the 12 tribes remind us that we are indebted to the people of Israel as we are to no other people. Abraham, he looked for a city with foundations but he understood that what he longed for would not be found on earth, it would be in heaven. So he lived his whole life in a tent. There's permission for you to buy a tent and to move out, to be a nomad. Like Abraham, we will truly be free when we understand that what we really crave is not a better car or a bigger house, 
but rather a city, not with one foundation, but 12, a new Jerusalem, heaven, the foundation of which the gospel of Jesus Christ is laid. That's what we should long for. And we talk about the dimensions of the city in Revelation 21, 15 through 17. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and the gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. He measured the wall of 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And there's differing views on these measurements. David Guzik says, New Jerusalem's length, height, and width are equal. It means that it's either a cube or a pyramid. A cube is reminiscent of the holy place of the tabernacle, suggesting the entire city is a holy place. The size of New Jerusalem is enormous, 1,500 miles, same distance from Maine to Florida. Square footage would be the approximate size of the moon. Morris says a city uh, this size is too large for the imagination to take in. John is certainly conveying the idea of splendor and more importantly that of, of room for everyone. Morris goes on saying he's guessing that there will be, have been 100 billion people in the human race through history, 20% of them being saved. Calculating that, each person would have a block with about 75 acres that they would call their own. Corson said 216 feet is a high wall, but not in comparison to a city that is 1,500 miles high. At times, due to a misunderstanding or breakdown in communication, you might feel like there's a wall between you and someone else. Well, you won't in heaven. The wall around New Jerusalem speaks of safety and security, but not of secrecy. We're going to know each other. We're going to feel safe. Verses 18 through 21, the material of the wall is jasper. The city was uh, pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third calicadi, mm -hmm, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, sixth sardius, seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Can you imagine how big that clam was? One pearl for the gate. The description of the construction materials, again, is mind-boggling to me. Any of you try to go buy a two-by-four lately? Materials are expensive here. But can you imagine this? Nothing like this. Jasper and gold? And this is literal, not symbolic. This is a realm, a, a, a realm of creation that is beyond our comprehension. And John's doing his best to explain it to us. But even with that good description, it falls short. We need to see it with our own eyes. I want to see it with my own eyes. John's trying to reiterate how valuable we are in God's eyes, each gemstone valuable in its own right. It points to an unending and staggering beauty, every square inch pointing to God's holiness and glory. The only other reference we have to gems like this, gemstones, is the high priest breastplate in Exodus 28. Wolverd says the constant mention of transparency indicates that the city is designed to transmit the glory of God in the form of light without hindrance. It's all-encompassing. It's his presence. The pearly gates. One thought is most likely that the pearl represents God's people. In Matthew 13, Jesus told the story of the man who sold everything to purchase a pearl. That's just what Jesus did. He gave everything he had, even his own life, to purchase us. This makes us the pearl, a fitting description, since a pearl is nothing more than an irritating grain of sand or a tiny parasite coated by the lustrous nars of an oyster. We are irritating indeed, 
parasitic beyond question, but God robes us and covers us and thereby he, thereby he makes us trophies in order that all of creation throughout eternity can marvel at his grace. In the streets of gold, can you imagine? But you don't have potholes like we do. Simply showing that things we find valuable on earth are commonplace in heaven. If all the dimension descriptions are confusing and impossible, there's two principles that we can keep in mind. First, we understand that the ideas communicated in, in all these details, it's all about the glory, beauty, and splendor of God. Second is that we understand this city whose architect and maker is God. We should expect it to be beyond our comprehension because his ways are truly higher than, his way, than, than our ways and his thoughts greater than our thoughts. Verses 22 and 23, a son will temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God has illuminated it and its lamp is the Lamb. In the ancient world, it would have been ludicrous to have a city without at least one temple in it. Even in American early history, if you look at how towns and cities were built, the church was at the center. And it'd be cool if we kind of did that still. The church was at the center. It would be similar to traveling to a new city today. And they don't have a McDonald's or a Starbucks? What's wrong with them? This new great city had no temple. For the Lord God Almighty, the Lamb, they are the temple. Nothing is removed but expanded. There was no place in the new city that was not holy and a dwelling place of God. In the Bible, there's four phases of the temple. Before Jesus, it was a prophecy. As Christians, we became the temple. In the millennium, a temple was made as a memorial to God and to what he did. And now we see in the new Jerusalem, the temple is everywhere, meaning that he is glorified and worshiped everywhere. And in that, heaven will be a pure place of worship. Things that we use and worship today can become a distraction. We have some nice things, but you've heard me say it before. We got big screen, skinny jeans, and fog machines. Laser lights. Even customs and traditions, things that we do. Those things can become a distraction. Can we not just simply worship God? Can we not worship the creator? Push back worshiping the creation. By faith, we can worship that way now. You can decide to trust in God so completely that your joy, what you consider beauty, and your foundation of knowledge are all based on Jesus and not on anything created. Laying everything down, opening your heart and your hands and simply worshiping God with all of your being. I've told you about back in youth ministry I had one of our kids that was upset because there was a battle then between traditional and contemporary music. And he was mad because we were singing a hymn and he walks out of the church. So by the time I catch up to him, he's actually worshiping in the middle of the parking lot standing next to a lamp pole. And he's worshiping the Lord. He's crying. And he's just worshiping God. I'm like, Sam, what are you doing? God told me I should be able to worship anywhere. So here I am. Never heard from him again. He never walked out of a service again. He worshiped the Lord. We should be able to do the same thing. Can we not just simply worship God wherever we're at? We come on Sunday morning. We have some instruments. We have vocals. It's awesome. But you should be able to worship anywhere. But especially worship here. Verses 24 through 27, the nations will walk by its light and the kings and the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, there will be, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean, no one who practices an abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wearsby said that the mention of nations in Revelation 21 uh, 24 and 26 suggests that there will be peoples, plural, on the new earth. Since the eternal state, there will be only glorified beings. We must not think that the earth will be populated with various nations such as exist today. Instead, these verses reflect on ancient practice of kings and nations bringing their wealth and glory to the city of the greatest king. 
In the heavenly city, everyone will honor the king of kings. Does this mean that such people will threaten the city? It isn't necessary to say that this is even an idea because all sinners and death have been cast into the lake of fire in Revelation 20.11. Instead, Johnson says, the exhortation warns present readers that the only way to participate in the future city is to turn one's loyalties to the Lamb now. Where we're at, that's up to us. That's what we can do. As we close, I want to circle us back for a minute. That aspect of no more tears. God will bring to completion all that he started. In eternity, of course, but also here. He sees your tears. He feels your pain. He knows what you're going through. It's not lost. He has a purpose in it a purpose that we can walk through and use. It's so we can re-engage in our faith, so we can dial into his will. Remember, as I read Philippians 1, 6, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. There are touch points in each of your lives, just like I talked about. There are points in your life where you can see that God has done a great work, where you've gotten through a rough spot and God has drawn you up to that next level in your faith. You remember mine, five years old, 13 years old, 17 years old, 26 years old, 49 years old. And as I said, it all sounds good. It all kind of flows together. But it's those in-between times that you've had as well. Yeah, God's done great things. But then you struggled with this. And God brought you back to that point again. Like there's that constant battle that we're working on. We fail. We're prideful. We're sinful. All of us at some point are downright rebellious. But God, who is faithful, will complete what he has started in you. He will bring it to completion. Remember Matthew 19, 26. With God, all things are possible. God is faithful to finish what he begins. He does so in a way that is above and beyond all that we can ask or imagine. So never underestimate what he will continue to do in you. Continue to seek him. You're going to struggle. I'm going to struggle. But you got to keep our eyes on God and keep walking. We keep pressing in and pressing through. Your legacy of faith will indeed outlive you. And in that, we strive to worship him with all of our being while we're on planet Earth. So God has started a work in you. If you're sitting in this room, if you're listening online, God has started to work in you. It's a new thing. Forget the former things. Forget the past. He's doing a new thing in you now, and he will complete it. The transformation of Paul and Peter, who had more than one bad day. Don't worry about that bad day. Don't judge yourself on that bad day. Take today and start in obedience to complete what it is he's called you to do. Every Sunday, when I get up here, I pray out of Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. And that should be a daily prayer. If God can create the whole world in six days, he surely can create a new heart in you now this morning. Are you going to surrender it all to him? Let's pray. If you're hearing this message, I just want to keep every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're hearing this message today, it's not by accident. This is one of those touch points of God in your journey, your journey called life. God's word simply says to confess and believe. Confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you, if you don't have a relationship with God, I'm going to ask you to pray something like this. Father God, I need you in my life. I can't do it alone. Forgive me of my sins. I confess that Jesus is Lord and that you raised him from the dead. And I'm asking you to walk with me, to guide me, to direct me. I surrender my life to you. 
in Jesus' name.